Welcome to our third day in the EWTN Lenten Retreat. It's later in the day than when we recorded the programs on Monday and Tuesday. And outside in County Down, it's starting to get dark. And so we've compensated by turning up the lights. There's uh, always in Ireland a dramatic play of a light and shadow. And uh, you also get the same in today's gospel because it's nighttime and we're in the upper room. In one sense, night is a very beautiful time. It's actually a time when sometimes we can see better than in the day. A saint is a person who can see in the dark because the source of light doesn't depend on what's going on outside them, but rather on the light of Christ at work within them. And so, if you notice, we sometimes talk about the institution of the Eucharist, the fifth mystery of light, as just that. The fifth mystery of light, the institution of the Eucharist. But of course, there is no institution of the Eucharist without the institution of the priesthood. What man could take bread and wine and change it into the body of, the, of Christ? It has to be another sacrament that the man receives in order that it's Christ doing the changing at every mass. So actually two sacraments are instituted in that upper room. St. John Paul II says, all priests are born at night in the upper room. I think that's why I find it hard to go to bed sometimes. <laughs> I love the night. And of course, the night is full of lights. God himself has filled the night with certain lights. And the saints like stars shine even brighter when the darkness comes. But there's the other image of night. For John reminds us that when Judas left the upper room, night fell. The weight of the darkness that represents man without God. The beginning and the end of everything God does is communion. God himself is a communion of three persons. This coming summer, we will host in Dublin the World Meeting of Families. And we're reminded by Pope Francis that the family is a living icon of the Most Holy Trinity, which is a communion of three persons. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Because the beginning and end of everything God does is his own communion in himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Therefore, it is the most important work of the church to bring all men and women and all creation to the communion of the Most Holy Trinity, which is our origin. John Paul II, in his encyclical letter, Novo Millennio Innoente, the encyclical he wrote to launch the new evangelization and the third millennium of the history of the world. He wrote in that, that communion must come before everything else. A spirituality of communion must precede all our plans and all our projects, all activities. 
He said, if we don't get the communion right, the work we do on behalf of God will not bear fruit. We're wasting our time, he says. We've got to get the communion right first. And so it's in the upper room that Jesus brings us to holy communion, his own divine life with the Father in the Holy Spirit. And interestingly, as you watch Pope Francis, communion and family are the number one item on his list. There are other important things to be done in the church, the renewal of the priesthood, the renewal of consecrated life, brothers and sisters in religious life. Maybe the liturgy, <laughs> people are saying, I like this way of mass and I like that way and I like this translation or whatever. These are very important works. Even the works of charity and the mission of the church. But Francis has said, family first. If we get family right, all the other fruits will flow. All the vocations will be there. But in being family, we will be closest to imaging God in whose image and likeness we were made. So on this Spy Wednesday in the upper room, Jesus works on communion by giving us himself in Holy Communion. The violence of men breaks that communion. At the beginning of the gospel, we see Judas going to the Pharisees, saying, how much will you pay me if I hand him over? What was his motive? When you deny someone something that they really want, people get very angry. We don't like to be denied things. And St. James says, if you really want it and you're denied it, you can become deadly. And so we see that on Monday, uh, Judas wanted the money for the expensive perfume that Mary massaged into the feet of Jesus. He wanted to rob that money, and Jesus denied him. And therefore, maybe that's why he's now at the Pharisees. His anger has moved him and broken him away from the communion of the other apostles. Jesus says, I burn with zeal. And so he brings us to the upper room that he may take away the burning of anger and replace it with the burning of love. In the Lenten message of Pope Francis, he draws our attention to Dante's Inferno. And in the Inferno, the devil is seen as seated on a throne of ice in frozen and loveless isolation. Pope Francis says, how does it happen that charity grows cold in us when we're denied things that we want. It's our will versus God's will. And so Jesus gives us the gift of surrendering everything to the wisdom and love of our Father and his will for our lives. In contrast to the frozen heart, Pope Francis tells us to look forward to the Easter vigil. For in that liturgical celebration, the new fire overcomes the darkness and the shadows. We pray, may the light of Christ rising in glory dispel the darkness of our hearts and minds. During the break, we have a song called Easy Solutions. And in that song, 
Paul Kyle, the author, describes a journey from darkness to light. Once again sung by Marion Jordan. This man brought relief to this thought And then watched the poor girl still distraught Now no heart beats within me What lie did you spin me? Oh God, you just tore me apart With one weep from his hand, and one breath from his mouth, and one look from his eye, he had come. But that foolish young man, to know better than God, stopped a life before it had begun. tried to escape to break free from this body of sin this cocoon which unfolds me entangles and scolds me this prison of mortal chagrin I tried easy solutions to find but they never brought me peace of mind. How I cursed and I swore, now I cried myself sore. It's my turn to step up to the line. With one wave from his hand and one breath from his mouth, and one look from his eye, he will come. Say, you foolish old man, to know better than God, stopping a life before it had begun. And I've traveled the world, seeking souls of the poor, and I think you know now must agree. A dead mother and child, but the poorest of all must be thee. All your life you have tried to escape, to 
break free from this body of sin. Yes, I know you meant well, but the way down to hell, it was paved with good intentions. You tried easy solutions to find. They never brought you peace of mind. Now the fire has consumed all your darkness and gloom, and it's love alone that's left behind. With the shadows deepening outside St. Patrick's Chapel here in County Down, we are invited by Christ to receive his light that we might pass over from darkness into new light and new life. We just heard during the break the lament of someone who, having encouraged um, the destruction of a newly conceived child lost his peace. And we love peace. <laughs> We're always searching for that peace at all levels of our lives. We're so, uh, we work so well when we're at peace. And when we don't have peace, nothing works for us. And so Christ comes with the gift of himself in Holy Communion in the upper room. And with communion, he says, peace I leave you. My peace I gift to you. A peace the world can't give you. Pope Francis notes in his Lenten message that what destroys charity more than anything is greed. We see that dramatically unfolding in the life of Judas this week and on this Spy Wednesday when he says, what will you give me? I want something. You give it to me and I'll give you something in return. And Pope Francis notes that once charity is destroyed, we lose our peace. He says, we end up preferring our own desolation rather than the comfort found in God's word and his sacraments. The loss of peace, then, he notes, takes a further step. It leads to violence against anyone we think would be a threat to our own certainties. The unborn child, the elderly and the infirm, the migrant, the alien among us, or our neighbor, who doesn't live up to our expectations. In the movie, The Jungle Book, there is a scene where the little child, Mowgli, encounters Ka, the snake. And Ka proceeds to hypnotize Mowgli she speaks and says, trust me, trust me. And as Ka speaks those words and hypnotizes Mowgli, you can see her tail wrapping round the child. It's interesting that what Patrick had to do first when he came to Ireland was break the spell. The people were under a spell 
wizards and druids and all sorts of occult. And so Christ comes with the light of his church and he says, no, trust me. It's interesting that the snake said, trust me, because that's exactly what Christ is saying in divine mercy. The only difficulty is he's wounded in divine mercy. And that makes us inclined not to trust sometimes. You see that in order to pass from the old creation as we are presented with it in Genesis, and which is wounded by sin, to the new creation that John sees in the book of Revelations, a new heaven and a new earth. Everything has to go through the cross. That's the narrow door. God didn't make the door narrow because he only wanted a few of us to get through. <laughs> he wants all of us to get through. He made it narrow to concentrate us on what's essential. Come through the cross. And in our natural state, we say, how could that be? How could we submit to the cross and death? And therefore, Christ places at the center of the cross peace. In our natural state, the cross is a frightening thing. We say, can I go around it or under it or over it? There's some other way. And Christ says, no, whatever cross is in your life, I've already carried it. I am carrying it with you, as Pope St. John Paul II says. My peace is hidden in the cross. You have to trust me. And instead, we're tempted by our fear of the future. Maybe someone finds themselves conceiving a life within them that they hadn't planned. And Christ says, my peace is here, if you trust me. Don't be tempted by the fear of the future, by easy solutions. At the moment in Ireland, we're having a struggle to keep in our constitution a clause that says of the unborn child, it is a full citizen of Ireland, the same as the rest of us, with the same rights, that most fundamental right to life. And there are men and women saying, it is better if that child is not born, if it has no future, if it's handicapped, if it's not welcome, But Christ warns us in the same words in the upper room, better for that man if he had not been born, that man who would take the life of another human being. Christ invites us to the secret of the source of life, it's through the cross. We don't stay on the cross. We pass over through the cross. And what dies is what is old and sinful. And what is made new is everything. Everything made new in Christ. The word alien is an interesting word. It's actually in the psalm today. The prophet says, because I have stood up for you, God, I have become an alien to my brothers. Nietzsche, the philosopher, said, my brother is my hell. And it's interesting that when Faustina was granted the grace of being brought to hell, she visited purgatory and hell. 
She said that one of the sufferings of hell is that you can hear the other souls cursing and in despair. So it's true of that place that my brother is my hell. Therefore, the great work of the present moment is to come to communion. What is going to free us from the darkness of our times? Christ says, I looked for consolers. I couldn't find any. There's a tremendous popularity at the moment with healing masses. And of course, healing is a tremendous gift of the Lord. But if God heals you, make sure he heals you to go forward in mission. Not so you can have the comfortable life that you had before you got sick. And actually, if you come close to Christ in the Eucharist in our times, you'll find he's suffering. It is because of generous souls who unite their suffering to Christ that actually the light is shining and overcoming the darkness. Join me again tomorrow on Holy Thursday, which brings together the two mysteries of light, the priesthood in the morning when the bishop celebrates the chrism mass with all the priests of his diocese and the institution of the Eucharist in which we are made truly brothers and sisters of Christ and each other.